Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to Tesla's Q4 2020 Financial Results and Q&A webcast. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker, Mr. Martin Vieca, Senior Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Sherry, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tesla's fourth quarter 2020 Q&A webcast. I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Zachary Kirkhorn, and a number of other executives. Our Q4 results were announced at about 1 p.m. Pacific time in the update deck we published at the same link as this webcast. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings with the SEC. During the question and answer portion of today's call, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Uh, please press star one now if you'd like to join the question queue. But before we jump into Q&A, Elon has some opening remarks. Elon? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so just to recap the year, uh, 2020 was a defining year for us on many levels. Despite a challenging environment, we reached an important milestone of producing and delivering half a million cars. Uh, I'd just like to uh, once again thank the people of Tesla for an incredible effort. Uh, we, we delivered uh, almost as many cars last year as we produced in our entire history. Uh, so really uh, an incredible uh, growth rate uh, and, and uh, despite a very challenging uh, 2020. So when, when my hat is off. Uh, it's such an honor to work with such great people at, at, at Tesla. So, um, and for the year, we, we, so we achieved free cash flow of nearly $2.8 billion after spending more than $3 billion on building new factories and other expenditures. Uh, we reached in industry-leading gap operating margin in addition to positive net income and record cash flow. Regarding ca capacity expansion, um, we, we, while we focused on execution, we, we continue to build a lot of new capacity. We started producing the Model Y out of Fremont and have almost reached full production speed. We, we ramped the Model 3 in Shanghai to more than 5,000 uh, cars a week sustainably, uh, and Shanghai continues to grow uh, rapidly. We introduced the heat pump to all of our vehicles. We ramped the single piece, we, we, we started and we were ramped to, to uh, volume uh, production uh, at the single piece castings for Model Y. This is where, uh, for the first time in history, the entire rear third skeleton of the, of the car is being cast as a single piece in the largest and most advanced casting machine ever made. Uh, we built a Model Y factory in China from start to finish in one year. We're also building Giga Berlin and Giga Texas, which we expect to start production later this year. And lastly, we built a, um, a, cell, a, a battery cell uh, factory in the Bay Area. Uh, and this, even though it is a pilot plant, it is, its capacity is um, large enough that it would be in the, probably the top 10 uh, battery cell factories on Earth, despite being a pilot plant. Uh, regarding the new Model X, S and X, um, we are launching the, we're super excited to announce the new Model S and Model X Plaid uh, are, are in production now and will be delivered in February. So we've, we've been able to bring forward the, the Plaid uh, Model S and X, and uh, so Model S will be delivered in February and Model X a little later. The Model S Plaid, in, we're actually in production now and we'll be, we'll be delivering uh, next month. Uh, so this is a tri-motor uh, Model S with a completely new interior. Uh, there, there are actually a lot of great things about this. I'll do another call about the, the Model S later, uh, but uh, it, it's really um, a, a tremendous uh, improvement um, over the prior version. Uh, and the, the Model S will be the first, this Model S Plaid will be the first production car ever that is able to go zero to 60 miles an hour in under two seconds. So no, no production car ever has been able to get below two seconds, zero to 60. This is a, a, a luxury sedan that is able to go 
zero to 60 uh, in less than two seconds. Uh, and uh, we'll have the ability to seat up to seven people with the, the third row uh, seats. So this is pretty nuts. This is faster to be clear than any car. This, it's not like there was a different type of car, like a two-door sports car that was able to do better fast than this. This is the fastest accelerating car ever made for that is allowed to go on roads in history. Um, and like I said, we'll start delivering it in, in a matter of weeks. Um, yeah, and just, you know, the, the, and like I said, we'll, I'll, I'll do some uh, gets into details. We'll the uh, model S changes um, uh, maybe later this week or next. Uh, but it, it's it's really better in in, in many ways. Uh, we'll be we will be actually raising the price of model S. Uh, for this new model, so people if you've got the old model, the, the new model will be ten thousand dollars more. So hopefully people aren't too upset if they bought the old model last month, but this one's ten k more. Um, so yeah, we think it's probably the best car of any kind at any price available in the world today. So um, then, with regard to full self driving, um, we've made massive progress on full self driving. If I recommend watching the videos of our uh, public beta. So we've got, I think, almost a thousand people in the in the beta at this point. And uh, it, with each successive release of the beta of the FSD software, it just gets it's really improving, improving uh, rapidly. Uh, it's now it's not very common for um, you know I, I drive the latest builds. It's very common for me to. Um, have no interventions uh, on drives that I do, including drives to places I've never been to. So these, these are not pre-planned routes. They're cars. Are, uh, the cars never been there before, and uh, it, it's now actually more more. It, it, it's more common than not for the car to have no interventions, even on a complex drive. So, uh, and and this is like basically, I'm highly confident the car will drive itself with the reliability in excess of human this year. Uh, this is a very big deal, um, and, and and thinking about like, you know, how does one justify the, the value of the company being where it is? Um, and I think there is a way, just with back of the envelope map, to potentially justify it, uh, where, you know, if, if Tesla ships, let's say hypothetically, um, fifty or sixty billion dollars worth of vehicles, and those vehicles become Full self-driving and can be used in rover taxis. Uh, uses rover taxis. Their utility uh, increases from an average of 12 hours a week to potentially an average of 60 hours a week uh, if, they're, um, if they're they're capable of serving as a rover taxi. So that, that's like roughly a 5x uh, increase in utility. Um, but, but but let's if, even if you say like okay, well let's just assume that the car becomes twice as useful as uh, it, it, not, not five times useful, but merely twice as useful. That would be a, a doubling again of the revenue of the company, um, which is in, you know almost entirely um, gross margin. So it would mean it, it would be like okay, if you made fifty million, fifty billion dollars worth of cars, it'd be like having fifty billion dollars of incremental profit, basically, from that because it's a soft, it's just software. So. Um, and if, if there were the case, then yeah, if you do 20 PE on that, it's like a trillion dollars. Um, and the company is still in high growth mode. So I think there is a way to sort of like, you know, justify the valuation of the company where it is uh, using just the cars and nothing else. Uh, cars with FSD. Um, and I, 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 I suspect at least some number of investors are uh, taking that approach. Um, so in, in conclusion, um, well, 2020 was a turning point for Tesla, and in terms of uh, profitability, uh, we believe this is just the beginning. Uh, we think 2021 is going to be uh, even more exciting, and, and you know, you don't know what to expect in a given year. Obviously, As last year we did not there were many many things we did not expect. Um, but assuming that 21 is a relatively normal year from an external standpoint, um, I think we're it's going to be a great year for Tesla. Um, we've got a ton of, you know, many great new products coming out. Uh, we've got factories that are um, advanced factories that are going to start up uh, production. Um, 
it'll, it'll also make it easier you know, having a factory in, in, in Berlin, one in, in Texas that can, just from a logistics standpoint, you know, Texas can help supply the eastern half of the U.S., and uh, Berlin can help supply Europe, um, and there's just fewer cars on boats, uh, much less capital tied up you know, with the cars that are yeah, on boats or going, uh, being transported to customers. Uh, and I think the fundamental efficiency of the company um, will be much better uh, w- with the factories, at least having factories on, on each continent and having two factories in the U.S. So I'm, I'm super excited about the future. Um, and, uh, yeah, really look forward to making it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think uh, uh, our CFO, Zach Kirkhorn, has some opening remarks as well. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, As Elon mentioned, 2020 has been an extremely successful year while managing through many unforeseen and unexpected challenges. On cash, we continue to generate strong free cash flows, reaching a record $1.9 billion in Q4, alongside growth and investment for future programs. Additionally, we've been able to reduce our use of debt and various working capital lines, including settling $2 billion of convertible debt in Q4, which will continue into Q1. For net income, we achieved our first calendar year and six sequential quarters of profitability. In addition, auto gross margin excluding credits improved from 2019 to 2020 despite reductions in ASP and inefficiencies from new product launches and transitions. On Q4 specifically, this was a noisy quarter, so let's unpack a few things. Stock-based comp increased, part of which is driven by the rise of the stock price over the course of our 2020 employee performance grant process and a portion of which is unique to Q4 only. The impact of SBC increases is seen um, across both COGS as well as operating expenses. Automotive gross margin in Q4 was primarily impacted by two things. First, we invested in improving our products built in Fremont, including converting over to the new Model S and Model X, launching the single-piece castings on Model Y, and introducing heat pump on Model 3. Second, logistics and labor costs were impacted due to supply chain instability and pandemic inefficiencies. Adjusting for items such as these, as we do in our internal management views, we saw an improvement in auto gross margin. Our services and other P&L was impacted by many of the same factors just mentioned, including onboarding costs associated with new service capacity. However, what's most important here is that we've accelerated the growth in service capacity and will continue to drive capacity expansion as fast as possible. On energy gross margin, we saw an impact from solar roof-related ramp costs and typical seasonality in the lease PPA business. OPEX, as a percentage of revenue, continues to reduce despite impacts from items mentioned, as well as increased investment in development of future products. Finally, the early settlement of our convertible notes resulted in an additional $100 million of interest expense for the quarter. All that being said, nothing has changed about our view that operating margin will continue to grow and remain industry-leading. As we look forward, 2021 may be our most meaningful step forward yet, as we see the benefits of long-standing investments in capacity and technology. The range of possible outcomes this year is wide, given the magnitude of launches. Thus, a few things we should keep in mind. We continue to expect a long-term volume CAGR of 50%, of which we may materially exceed this in 2021. As we increase production rates, volumes will skew towards the second half of the year and ramp inefficiencies will be a part of this year's story and are necessary to achieve our long-term goals. Specifically for Q1, our volumes will have the benefit of early Model Y ramp in Shanghai. However, S and X production will be low due to the transition to the newly re-architected products. Additionally, we're working extremely hard to manage through the global semiconductor shortage as well as port capacity, which may have a temporary impact. We will continue to invest heavily in supercharging and service capacity while driving reductions on cost, including OPEX as a percentage of revenue. Global demand continues to outpace production, and we are moving as quickly as we can with a focus on the long term. I look forward to providing updates on progress throughout the year. Thank you very much. Uh, And now we can jump straight into questions from Say Technologies. The, The first question from institutional investors is, uh, what is currently holding Tesla back from being the market share leader in solar? Yeah, so uh, we're actually seeing tremendous growth in solar uh, quarter over quarter last year. And um, we had uh, our best quarter since, I think, 2018 in Q4. So 
we, we, we do actually expect to become the market share leader in solar and, and then go far beyond that. Um, it's, uh, you know, fortunately, we had, there were a few years there where we, we, we had to devote the whole company to uh, Model 3 production um, and, uh, you know, and, and you know, building. It, it just, it, we have to basically take the whole company, including flash people that were, were on solar, uh, and have work on cars. But now, uh, now we've got a little bandwidth. We're putting a lot of attention on solar, and it is growing rapidly. So I think it will not be long before Tesla is by far the market leader in, in solar. Another really important part of the solar strategy is uh, achieving an industry-leading cost structure, which then allows us to have industry-leading pricing. And so that's something that uh, that we've accomplished over the last year in terms of getting the cost structure in the place that it needs to be. Uh, and you know, as Yvonne mentioned, this is a really important part with industry-leading pricing to become the leader in the space. Yeah, and actually an important part is um, – Achieving better integration between the Tesla Powerwall and the Tesla Retrofit Solar and Tesla Roof, um, and we're confident we'll have excellent integration, uh, excellent, inter excellent integration with the, um, with the Powerwall and, and, and Tesla Solar, whether it's Retrofit or um, the, the Tesla Solar Glass Roof um, before the end of the year. So it's, it's really, I think we've got a good strategy. Um, as Zach mentioned, we're um, we're focused on reducing the amount of time and the complexity of the install, and we're making great progress in that regard. Um, and I think we'll, we'll have something that's really dialed in um, this year. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, uh, could current owners get ability to transfer their FSD to their next vehicle? This would be a huge for loyalty and overall increased sales of vehicles while offering more FSD sales on used vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're not considering that at this time. Um, we do actually offer an increased, a, a higher price than for, for a car with FSD than the one without FSD. Uh, and I do think that the market currently undervalues or the, with the consumer market and, and, and arguably the stock market does probably undervalue the uh, just how good FSD is going to be. Um, but we're not currently planning on on offering on allowing it to get transferred. Thank you. Um, we will be offering subscription pretty soon in the next month or two. So that that should address a lot of people's concerns for being able to get it. Thank you very much. Uh, and the third question is, uh, can you give us a progress update on dry coating of the battery electrode at the battery day? Elon said. I would not say this is completely in the bag, as uh, yet as the yields were low. Andrew? Yeah, um, sure. It's true. The, the in-house cell manufacturing system we revealed at Battery Day contains uh, new processes and equipment. So we did expect some unknown unknowns and technical challenges to arise through the production ramp. Uh, the Cato team, however, has been able to solve each manufacturing problem presented to date and continues to improve yield and rate week over week and month over month as we move up the production S-curve. Um, at the same time, the cell engineering team's refined designs and deepened understanding has reinforced our confidence in the drive process and 4680 design, meeting our performance and cost targets. Um, and from a capacity perspective, we have 10 gigawatt hours worth of equipment landed at Cato. The production staff is nearly all hired our material supply chain is established, and the team is on track for full production ramp this year. Meanwhile, we've developed enough engineering confidence with our 4680 design and the production process and equipment to kick off manufacturing equipment and facility construction to support our 100 gigawatt hour 2022 goal. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, um, why are you confident Tesla will achieve level five autonomy in 2021? And why is Dojo not necessary to get there? Um, I, I guess I'm confident based on um, my understanding of the technical roadmap um, and the, the progress that we're making between uh, each beta iteration. Um, yeah. Um, 
as I was saying, it's it's now not not remarkable at all for the car to completely drive you from one uh, location to another through a series of complex intersections. Um, it's it's now about just improving the corner case reliability um, and getting it you know to you know, 99.99 percent reliable with respect to uh, an accident. Basically, better, we need to get it to better than uh, than human by a factor of at least 100% or 200%. Um, and uh, but this is happening rapidly because we've got so much training data uh, with, with all the cars in the field. And um, the, the software is improving dramatically. The, we also write the, the software for, uh, for labeling. Um, and I must say, it is quite challenging. We're moving everything towards to, towards video labeling, so it's all video labeling, all video inference. And um, so there, there's still a few of the neural nets that need to be upgraded to uh, for, uh, video uh, training and video, and video inference. Um, and really, as we as we transition each net to um, to video, uh, the, the performances become exceptional. Um, so this is like a hard thing with the video, the, 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 the labeling software that we wrote for video labeling, um, making that better has a huge effect on the uh, efficiency of labeling. Uh, and then of course the holy grail is auto labeling. Um, so we're doing a lot of work into having the labeling tool be more uh, efficient when used by a person as, as well as uh, enabling auto labeling where we can. Uh, at Dojo, uh, it's a sort of training supercomputer. Uh, we believe it'll be, we, we think it may be the best uh, neural net training computer in the world by possibly an order of magnitude. Um, so it is, a, it is a whole thing in and of itself. Um, and this is something we could offer potentially as a service. Uh, so uh, if somebody, if others need neural net training, it, you know, we're not trying to keep it to ourselves. Um, so this, I think this thing, I think Dojo could be uh, a whole line of uh, business in and of itself. Um, and then, of course, for training vast amounts of video data uh, and getting the, um, the reliability from, say, 100% to 200% better than an average human to 2,000% to, to better than average human. So it will be very helpful in that regard. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what is Tesla's current gigawatt hour run rate of the 4680 cell production? How do you see this run rate evolving by mid-2021 or end of 2021? I think we, we kind of talked about that, Drew. Uh, I mean, essentially what, what we're saying is that um, the, the number to think about to focus on is like we have, we've got a 100 gigawatt hour total that uh, Tesla cells produced in 2022. Um, it, it's not that important to look at the, the run up to there because the, the, these things tend to improve exponentially. Um, but we are installing capacity for it, you know, in 2022 for 200 gigawatt hours a year. And we think probably um, we, sh we should be able to achieve 50% of of targeted design capacity uh, in 2022. Yeah, yeah, agreed, Elon. And as you've said before, with the S curve of production, um, you can be off a little bit on the initial part of the S curve, and that makes a difference in absolute capacity by quite a bit one month to the next. So, yeah, I mean, we're we are progressing up that S curve as fast as we possibly can. Yeah, and we, and we don't see any showstoppers. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, and one more question is from uh, retail investors. Uh, what is Tesla doing to improve service experience? Tesla had a reputation for outstanding customer service. Now it's impossible to even call a service center and appointments are scheduled weeks out. Jerome? Yes. Um, well, for us, best service, no service. So we, we spent a lot of effort trying to improve the quality and the reliability of our cars. In the last two years, um, the um, frequency of service visits are reduced by one third. So um, people have to, uh, customers have to come less frequently in the service, which is really the goal, no service. 
And if um, service has to take place, we're trying to make it as painless as possible. Uh, one big effort there is to increase mobile service, which is now more than 40% of all visits in North America. We're trying to push that to 50% uh, this year. Um, in 50% um, of service uh, visits uh, last less than two hours. Uh, so we're trying to service the cars very quickly so people can get their vehicles back on the road. And uh, in terms of service appointment, um, it, it continues to improve. We have about uh, we have actually 140 service centers right now in North America. For 100 out of those 140, uh, you can get appointments in less than 10 days. And we're going to make sure it's all service centers uh, are um, have a short wait time. Uh, we're accelerating, as uh, Zach mentioned earlier, the pace of opening. We, in North America, we open 11 uh, centers in December, and we have uh, plans to open 46 in the first half of this year. So that's what we're doing to improve service. Uh, in terms of phones, uh, our uh, emphasis is on the app. Uh, really, we want all communications to go through the app, the Tesla app, uh, and we're trying to move away from the phone. The app is much better than the phone. Um, it can spot directly alerts directly from the car and schedule a service appointment. And there is a re written record of all communication um, between the customer and the service team. You can have pictures in there. You can take care of your payment without entering the credit card and doing all that stuff. Uh, you get updates on the service. And there's even more uh, features that are going to come uh, in the coming months on the app, and that I think everybody will be happy, including the ability to spot uh, where your service technician is and uh, how far it is to, to coming from your car and what's going on there. So we are investing everything on the app, I think just like most other companies as well, and that's the way of the future. Thank you very much. And now let's go to institutional investor questions. The question number one, what are the key milestones we need uh, to achieve in order to evolve current FSD to a commercial level four, level five ride sharing solution? Yeah, so uh, it, it, it really goes back to what I was saying a moment ago, which is we need to transition all of the neural nets in the car to um, a video. Um, and in order to, to do that, the, the whole stack has to be so the stack has to be changed to video. So that means that, uh, gathering video clips, uh, then using, and, and this is actually surround video. So you've got eight cameras operating simultaneously um, um, with, with, you know, the, with, with synchronized frame rates. So you've got uh, uh, basically eight frames surround video, um, eight, eight cameras surround video. Um, and then you've got to label um, basically everything in that in that video uh, 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 snippet, and and then train against that, and then have those neural nets operate the car. Uh, so, um, um, and, and this is coming from the past where we would label the neural nets would be a single camera, single frame. Um, so no no video, and not and not combining the cameras. Um, and, and then we went from single frame, single frame, one frame at a time, one camera at a time, neural nets to surround camera um, neural nets. Where it would look at all at images from all, all eight cameras, but but only one frame at a time. Uh, and now to where we include the time dimension, uh, and that's that's video. So um, I it really just see this as a question of of getting the work done. We're getting it done. And you can see the results in the um, rapidly improving FSD betas that are released. And we're, we're also going to be expanding the FSD, FSD beta itself to include uh, more and more people. Um, so, and from my standpoint, it looks a, a bit like a very clear and obvious path towards uh, a vehicle that will drive, you know, 100% safer than a person. Um, yeah, I really do not see any obstacles here. Um, Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And the second question from institutionals is, does Tesla plan uh, or expect to license any of its software applications, FSD, and AutoBidder in particular, to third-party OEMs? 
I think we're very open to licensing our software to to third parties. Um, and we've had some um, preliminary discussions about licensing autopilot to other OEMs. So uh, this is something we're, we're more than happy to do. Um, and, you know, but I think obviously we, like, we need to probably do a little bit more work to prove that Tesla autopilot is capable of full self-driving, um, which like I, said, I think will become obvious later this year. Uh, and then we're more than happy to uh, license that to other car companies. We're, we're definitely not trying to keep it uh, to be a Tesla exclusive situation. Um, and I think probably the same goes for Autobitter. We haven't thought as much about Autobitter, but um, the, the Tesla philosophy is definitely not to create uh, walled gardens. Um, you know, we're, we're going to uh, allow other companies to use our supercharger networks um, and, uh, yeah, using our autonomy software and Autobitter and perhaps other things uh, would be fine too. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, key differences in product customer preferences, FSD strategy between China and the rest of the world. Do we need to do things differently to win the Chinese EV market? Well, we currently are winning the, we are currently the leader in the Chinese EV market. So, um, so I think we're, we must be doing something right if we're the best-selling um, electric car in China. Um, that said, a very few of our customers in China, I think it may be as low as one or two percent, actually have selected the FSD uh, option. This is much lower than the rest of the world. Um, so, you know, we um, definitely need to make make it work well in China. I think as soon as it works well in China, then we will have a high stake rate for FSD. Um, I find the the the, the, the customers in China, uh, Tesla owners in China, are among the most concerning in the world. Um, they their attention to detail is, is incredible. So, um, they, 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 they will, I, I'm confident that they will um, buy FSD as soon as it is working well in China. And, and you know, hopefully that is later this year. Thank you. Uh, and the next question is, is it fair to argue that the best way to think about companies' long-term earnings power is, uh, is tied to profit per unit of battery capacity? A uh, three terawatt hours target from battery day implies half of long-term battery capacity goes to storage, depending on what you assume for pack size on Elon's 20 million uh, vehicle unit goal. Um, yeah, uh, it is. So the, the fundamental limit on electric vehicles right now in general is to availability of, um, of cells. Uh, what's the output of battery cells in, in, in gigawatt hours? Um, and you can't grow faster than that. Um, now, at Tesla, we've improved the efficiency of our cars dramatically such that you can actually get a pretty good range e even with the standard range battery pack. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, in the high, two it's approaching, the, for Model 3, it's approaching the sort of high 200s, um, and, with, you know, with some slight continued improvements, we'll start to get to, you know, 300-mile range, even with standard pack and, you know, on order of 500 kilometers. So um, there's efficiency improvements in the car, but fundamentally the growth is dependent on uh, cell production. Um, and um, there's also a lot of other, other companies that want to, that have a need for cells. So the, but the reason Tesla is doing its own cell production is in order to accelerate the growth. Um, it is not, it is not to, to make less use of our cell suppliers. In fact, I want to be really clear, Tesla wants to increase purchases from cell suppliers. And we've been very clear with our cell suppliers, uh, you know, whether it be CATL or Panasonic or uh, LG, that we will take as many batteries as they can produce. So, and we, we urge them to increase their uh, production and we will buy as much as they can send to us. Um, obviously, there are some price limits on that because the car still needs to be affordable. Um, but it, it, I'm just trying to be as clear as possible that our goal with uh, making our own cells is not to uh, disintermediate our suppliers. It is to supplement our suppliers. And we want our suppliers of cells to increase their production and, in addition, have our own production that is 
simply taking up the amount beyond which they are um, either unable or unwilling to increase their production. Um, so it's an acceleration over and above what the most that our suppliers say they can produce for us. Um, and so probably the, you know, since the cell output drives vehicle output, um, the yeah, and 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 then I mean it, it, probably the board brushstroke value of, of Tesla is just what's the cell output that implies vehicle output and then at least double that for the autonomy autonomy revenue um, probably more than double um, and that that's how you figure out the value of the company I think long term. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is about 4680 cells, which we already covered in the, in the retail section of this call. Uh, so let's go straight to the last question uh, from institutional investors, which is, where are you in Cybertruck development? Uh, what are your expectations for Cybertruck deliveries in 2021? All right, so we, we finished um, uh, almost all of the Cybertruck uh, in engineering. So we're no longer iterating at the design center level uh, or design level. We've We've got the designs fixed. Um, we're um, getting to, uh, you know, we'll see an order of the equipment necessary to make the cyber truck work. We're actually going to be using even uh, bigger casting machines for the rear body of the cyber truck because you've got obviously it's a bigger vehicle and you've got a long uh, truck bed that's going to support a lot of load. So we'll be using an 8,000 ton casting press. Uh, for the rear body casting as opposed to 6,000 ton for uh, Model Y. Um, so 6,000 ton was the biggest casting press in the world. 8,000 ton, obviously, yeah, quite a bit bigger than that. And uh, I think it's going to be an incredible vehicle. Um, if we get lucky, we'll, we'll be able to do a few deliveries towards the end of this year, uh, but I expect volume production to be in 2022. Thank you very much. And now we can start with questions in the uh, in the queue. Thank you. Our first question will come from Colin Rush with Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Thanks so much, guys. Could you talk a little bit about the regulatory environment for FSD and, and how you're seeing that play out? Obviously, it's a, a bit of a moving target right now, and, and you guys are leading the way here. But we'd love to understand how those conversations are going and how you see that impacting the rollout of FSD uh, throughout the balance of this year and into next year. Um, okay. See, Zach, do you want to start with or Zach and draw? You know, the, uh, what, what we're seeing right now in the U.S., for example, is a pretty dynamic space, but it's overall not particularly limiting on a rule basis. But what we're going to expect is to have to work with regulators to demonstrate really, really high reliability, as Elon said before. The rest of the world's fairly dynamic. In Europe, we see a general slowdown. Uh, generally not reaching past level three right now uh, with some impetus to start working on new working groups to reach past that. And China showed an interest in working on level four or even level five later this year. So we expect a pretty dynamic 2021 in the regulatory space with leadership in the U.S. looking for uh, manufacturers to demonstrate really good launches and really high reliability before uh, releasing to wider and wider groups. Um, thanks, guys. And, and then just a quick follow-up around inflation on some of the materials markets. Obviously, there's there's a lot going on as low interest rates flow through the, the basic material space. Can you talk a little bit about the supply chain and how you're mitigating some of your exposure around uh, some of your, your raw material costs? And this is Jerome. Yeah, uh, for supply chain, the first priority now is to deal with the disruptions uh, from COVID and uh, shipping, in particular um, boats um, between Asia and North America. Um, but we're also looking uh, forward to uh, pricing, and we're watching this very closely for all the components. Uh, we are entering a series of long-term agreements uh, with uh, um, preferred suppliers to ensure that not only we're going to have enough quantity to support the growth, 50% KGAR, as uh, uh, Zach mentioned earlier, but also uh, good pricing with 
uh, appropriate sharing of the risks. Thank you. Our next question will come from Dan Levy with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, two two questions. Uh, uh, one on twenty one, and just uh, one on capital. Uh, first on twenty one. Any expectations for what we should see on uh, regulatory credit sales? And then the second question is on capital. Obviously, you raised a lot of capital uh, in 2020. You know, what should we think about for use of those funds beyond just covering some of the charities? And can you just give us a sense of what the elevated liquidity does and doesn't buy, meaning to what extent does elevated capital enable you to accelerate plans on building capacity or expanding vertical, vertical integration, accelerating timing on full self-drive features? Uh, so, those are the questions. Thank you. Sure. On the regulatory credit sales side, uh, th this isn't always an area that's extremely difficult for us to forecast. Uh, 2020 regulatory credit sales ended up being higher than our expectations, and um, it, it's difficult to give guidance on that. I mean, what I've said before is that in the long term, regulatory credit sales uh, will not be a material part of the business, and we don't plan the business around that. It's possible that for a handful of additional quarters, it remains strong. It, it's also possible that it's not. You know, mo most of our regulatory credit revenue from Q4 uh, was not lined up prior to the beginning of the quarter, and these were discrete deals that were struck over the course of the quarter. So I, I wish I could give you more on this, Dan, but it, it's a space that's extraordinarily difficult for us to forecast. Um, on the second side, with respect to capital, um, a, a couple of things that we're thinking through there. So, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, debt reduction is an important thing that we're focused on now. Uh, early conversions, you know, th these are things we don't have a choice on. Um, we did around $2 billion of that in Q4. We currently have $1.4 billion that we expect to go out in Q1 as a result of early conversions or conversions on convertible debt, uh, that number may increase. And so debt reduction is important. That's helpful on interest expense as well. Uh, we are also using the money with respect to our investments in future capacity. And so what we're able to do now that we haven't had the opportunity to do in the past is as we're building capacity, particularly in Austin and Berlin, we can build that capacity with the expectation of what the end state of capacity will be, pulling forward some of those investments, rather than uh, incrementally adding capacity as we go along. And so th this is an important part in terms of capital efficiency that we haven't had the luxury to do in the past, and it's great to be able to have the liquidity to focus on that. Um, and then more broadly, as Jerome was touching on, uh, service expansion is really important to the future strategy of the company. So as you saw in our Q4 numbers, uh, the expansion of service centers and mobile service from Q3 to Q4 increased quite a bit and was also quite a bit higher than the first part of the year. And so we're able now to make investments there and also in the supercharging network to get ahead of future demand, which will cost us more in the near term, but is what the right long-term thing is for our customers and the company. Thank you. Our next question will come from Alex Potter with Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, was wondering, you, you mentioned how you'd like to increase your purchases and sales from suppliers. Um, does this require them to also have the capability to build structural 4680 cells of the sort that you're putting in uh, this, you know, these newer iterations of vehicles? Uh, <clears throat> no, it does not. Um, although we, we are uh, talking with them about making the 4680 form factor uh, but they, it, it is not required. Um, for example, the uh, the new the new S currently uses the 18650 form factor, uh, so they're just a more advanced cell, uh, and we think we'll continue to use that form factor for at least a, you know a, a few years. Um, but we, we will over time be retiring the form factors and trying to move to a consistent form factor. So. Um, but it is not a requirement that we place upon our suppliers because uh, it would it would just result in, in fewer sales. So it's better for us to deal with the complexity of different cell phone factors than insist on a single phone factor for our, our suppliers uh, today. But like I said, over time, it will make sense to 
have a consistent form factor. Okay, makes sense. And then one additional, maybe qualitative question on capacity expansion. You've mentioned in the past, I mean, access to dollars is one thing, but access to human beings that are sufficiently qualified is another. Uh, have you run up against any issues on that front that would potentially limit your growth in any way? Thanks. Um, but that is one of the things that limits growth is, it, it, or, to, or limits the growth rate. It doesn't limit the ultimate size, but limits the growth rate, which is what's the rate at which we can onboard um, great people and get them trained in the in the right areas. Um, you, you certainly can't like instantaneously if you've got a factory that has 20,000 employees, you can't you can't just hire 20,000 people instantly. Um, they they've got to, they're usually doing something else, so they've got to transition from whatever they were doing or move from some other part of the country. Um, and, uh, and so there's a certain amount of time required for that. Um, I mean, that, that said, we, we, we do think that um, we can maintain a, a growth rate in excess of 50% per year for, for many years to come. Um, and, uh, you know, at least, like to, yeah, at, at least for 50% a year for many years to come. Um, I think this year we may track to a fair bit above 50 percent, but we don't want to commit to that, but at least that's what it would appear. And the same again next year, it appears to be meaningfully above 50 percent. Thank you. Thank you. Our Let's next question will come from Joseph Speck with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Elon, back in uh, 2018, you, you tweeted about electric vans and how it could be interesting to work with, with Daimler and Sprinter. We, we haven't really heard any, of anything since, but in the meantime, we've seen a lot of activity in that electric van and last mile space from a number of established players and startups. Um, so I know you said that you have a lot of projects on the table, but can you provide us an update of your thoughts on this market, and is it something you're interested in? I think Tesla is definitely going to make an electric van at some point. The thing to bear in mind is, is, is that there is fundamentally a constraint on battery cell output. Um, the, you know, it, it, it's con like if, if, you're, if one is not involved in manufacturing, it's really hard to appreciate just how hard it is to scale production. It's, it's the hardest thing in the world. Um, prototypes are easy. Um, scaling production is very hard. Um, so, um, but, but, uh, you know, a big part of the reason, the main, the main reason we have not uh, accelerated um, new products is, like, for example, the Tesla Semi. Is that we simply don't have enough sales for it. Like we, we, this, if, if we were to make the semi, like right now, uh, which we, we could eat, we could easily go into production with the semi, but we would not have enough sales for it right now. Um, we will have sales for enough sales for the semi when we are producing um, the Tesla 4680 in volume. Um, but for example, the semi would use typically five times the sell, number of sales that a, that a car would use, um, but it would not sell for five times what a car would sell for. So uh, it, it kind of doesn't make, it would not make sense for us to do the semi right now, but it will absolutely make sense for us to do it as soon as we can um, address the cell production constraint. And the same would go for a van. Okay, thank you. And then maybe if I could dig into your past on one, one more item. About two years ago at the Autonomy Day, you stated that you're working on the next gen Tesla chip, which was about two years away. So is there any update on that front? Um, yeah, I mean, to, be, to be clear, we have, we have still not, um, the software still does not fully use the capabilities of the FSD version one computer. Um, it, it is really just an incredibly powerful computer. Um, and I have, um, I'm, I'm personally certain that you can achieve full self-driving uh, with a safe level of hard access of a person just using the, the full self-driving version one computer. The version two we expect to be about three times as powerful, um, uh, and and this 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 would need to be paired with um, higher resolution cameras, um, and uh, so it, it's it's quite a it it require a bunch of things to change simultaneously, um, but we we have not been rushing 
the version two of the, the chip, it, it, it's coming along well and it's, it's in good shape. But um, since we can achieve SSD cooled up routing with the current system, um, it, it would actually be a distraction right now if we were to introduce the full self driving uh, the Tesla FSD chip two, um, because it, it, it would set us back quite a bit on software. Um, and software is the critical path to uh, full self driving. So, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. It's, that that's not a that's not a that that's that's a, that's an improvement, but not a game changer. The FSD two, um, getting the software to work and getting all the neural nets uh, to be video. Uh, that's, that's the game changer. Thank you. Our next question will come from Emmanuel Rosner with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, my first question is about your uh, in-house cell manufacturing efforts. So in addition to building up capacity, some of the goals you highlighted was to cut the pricing or the cost by about 50%, boost the range by about 50% over a number of years. So wanted to know if your initial efforts are you know, trending in that direction, what is sort of like the timeline to achieve these goals, and maybe related to this, uh, how are you thinking about the timeline for the cheaper uh, Tesla, the entry model, potentially? I think we feel very confident about achieving those, those targets, let's say over a three-year time frame. Um, I don't know, Drew, I, it's, not, it's not like year one. Um, so three, yeah, I mean, maybe four years, give ourselves a little room. But for three or four yeah. years, I'd say, yeah. We, 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 we put together the trajectory, you know, in the battery day, and we're, we're on that trajectory still. I think that that's probably the best reference for the cost trajectory that we are on. Yeah. I mean, we, we're, we're aspiring to do better than what was presented at battery day, but, but we, we're confident of at least – for doing what we presented at Battery Day. Thank you. Our next question will come from Ben Kalal with Baird. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, thank you, Elon. Uh, congrats to the whole team. Um, so uh, we're trying to put together all the bread crumbs. If I remember correctly, going back you know, 10 years, um, you talked about when you had a mass market car on the road that you would step down as CEO um, and be a chief architect. And then, and then we have, you know, you go into Hawaii to see Larry, to see Larry um, and the, the X.com, and I'm trying to put it all together. <laughs> so there's a lot of questions there. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, well, um, I, I expect to be CEO of Tesla for you know, several years. Uh, so, um, I think there's, there's still a lot that I'm super excited about doing, and um, and I think uh, it would be hard to leave a, a lot of these uh, great projects halfway or part like part way done. So um, yeah, I, I do expect to be running the company for for several years into the future. Um, now, obviously, nobody you know no, nobody is or should be CEO forever. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't expect to be. It, 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 like the, uh, the sheer amount of work required to be CEO of Tesla is in, is insane, um, and uh, I, you know, I, I do. I think I do probably more. Well, I definitely do more technical work than is typical for a CEO. So, um, it, it it would be nice to have a bit more free time on my hands, um, as opposed to just <laughs> working day and night. <laughs> From when I wake up to go to when I go to sleep, seven days a week, it's pretty intense. Um, so, but I think the, the mission isn't over yet, and and we still got a long way to go before we um, can really make a dent in the world on accelerating the advent of sustainable energy. Um, I mean, the, the goal of Tesla from the beginning uh, has been to accelerate 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 sustainable energy. And but if you say like what percentage of cars on the road are electric today, it's all very very tiny, like on an order of one percent. Or I think less than one percent of the total fleet worldwide. So, it, so that's that's still a hell of a long way to go for, you know, quarter on the order of one percent of the fleet is electric. Um, there's 
it's also a tremendous way to go on solar power, although it's exciting to see the the, the, um, the advent of uh, very cost competitive wind and solar and geothermal. And, uh, and of course, we, we need a large volume of stationary battery packs. I mean, but basically, the, the, I mean, the three legs of a sustainable energy future are uh, sustainable energy generation via you know, solar, wind, geothermal, and hydro, and a few others. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm actually not against uh, nuclear fission. I actually think nuclear fission is, you know, with, with a well-designed reactor in a situation that is not subject to uh, bad weather or, or seriously bad weather is, is actually, it is a good thing to do. So, um, and then, but then the second thing you need is you need stationary storage, you need batteries, uh, because uh, most renewable energy is intermittent. It doesn't, the wind doesn't blow all the time, the sun doesn't shine all the time. So you need a lot of batteries uh, and, and they need to be very long lasting and high cycle life. And then you need electric transport. And if you have those, th- those, those three things, we've got a, a very bright future with respect to uh, energy and the, and the environment. So it's a long way to go on that. And so, so I'm still you know, very much fired up to work on that. Fantastic. And let's uh, take the last question, please. Thank you. Our last question will come from Gene Munster with Loop Ventures. Please go ahead. I was happy to see the update on the timing of semi and had a couple of related questions. And first, since semi trucks typically travel predictable highway miles, will Tesla semi be the first to achieve full autonomy? I think that's quite likely, yes. Fantastic. Uh, yes, I can't, can't imagine. I, I'm not sure who would be number two, but yeah, it, it, it seems highly likely. Yeah. Okay. The my... It's the exact same part numbers on the semi yeah. than it is on the Tesla cars. There's, there's no difference. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah, but, as, as it is, we we need to modify the the, the, the parameters, the software parameters change for um, autopilot uh, or for self driving. Because um, it needs to know if it's in a Model Three, Model Y, Model X, or Model S, um, and so this is we just inform inform the vehicle or inform the, the, the full self driving brain that it is now in a semi truck. <laughs> um, okay. Would it need to be retrained then as part of that? Uh, no, I, I think there will be there, there, you'll have a different uh, control functions because you know there are turns that you could do in a regular car that you cannot do in a semi. Like you don't want to you don't want to try to parallel park this thing and <laughs> on the street in city you know be <laughs> um, it, it, it needs to know its limitations um, being a giant truck makes makes sense my my follow up question was related to if you could just help explain why battery electric uh, will win versus hydrogen cell field tech. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've had this question a million times for just for regular vehicles, even back in the early Roadster days, even before we had the Roadster out, people were saying, you know, that somehow hydrogen is going to be a better means of energy storage in a, in a, in a car than um, than batteries. And it's like, this is just really not the case. Um, hydrogen is a very, it's number one on the periodic, periodic table. It's got very low density. Um, it's... Uh, it's got low density as a liquid. It's like styrofoam level density as liquid. And then it's only a liquid very close to absolute zero. So you have to have a, it's really not realistic to keep it as liquid. You want to have it as a high pressure gas. That has even lower density. So you need a gigantic fuel tank um, volumetrically. And it's got to be very high pressure. It's a big pain in the ass, basically. Um, if somebody was going to say, use an alternate, uh, chemical energy, energy storage mechanism to hydrogen, I'd say they should use propane or something like that, or methane, or th- th- those will be way better than hydrogen. Um, and then having it be t- a fuel cell just adds even further complications to the situation. It, it's just crazy, basically. Um, and uh, you know, we're extremely confident that we could do long range trucking with, uh, with batteries. <laughs> the, the, the amount that works out, you don't, if you could just like take say what hours per kilogram of currently available cells and say, okay, how, you know, how, how much, what, what weight would you need to go? Let's say 500 miles. Um, and you know, to what degree does that affect your payload? And it's like, okay, you can do this. If you do it right, you basically have 
no effect on your payload or almost nothing. Um, and you can have a long range truck. I mean, Jerome, do you want to add to that? No, I agree uh, with everything. And uh, um, we um, uh, we see also an increase on um, the rege regionalization of trucks. Uh, and I think it will be perfect. Uh, the, the Tesla Semi will be perfect for it, yeah. And um, yeah, I'm very look I'm looking forward to having some additional ones on the road very soon. But basically, we do not see any um, issues with creating a compelling long-range truck with batteries. Right. Uh, apart from, apart from cell supply, cell supply is the only thing. Cell yeah. supply is it. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. So thanks for all of your great questions. And uh, we will speak to you again in about three months. Thank you. Right, thanks a lot. Bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. Mm -hmm.